Good afternoon. Welcome to our special event today, A Woman's Voice, Understanding Autistic Needs. I'm Susan Daniel. I'm the director of the Office of Autism Research Coordination at the National Institute of Mental Health. Our office manages the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, which is a federal advisory committee that provides advice on autism spectrum disorder to the government. And we host special events like this one on behalf of the committee and on behalf of the National Institutes of Health. I'm happy to welcome today our guest speakers, our in-person audience, and those who might be watching online to this special event. We do have a quiet room. We have CART, and there is closed captioning on the video for anybody who's watching. And today we're going to be hearing from four speakers who are editors and authors of two books about women on the autism spectrum. One called Spectrum Women and another called Autism in Heels, with, which both describe the experience of being a woman on the autism spectrum. And we are just very excited to have these four women here today. I'll give you a brief introduction to each one. So Ms. Barb Cook from Australia is the editor of the book Spectrum Women. She's also the editor-in-chief of the online Spectrum Women magazine and editor and co-author of Spectrum Women Walking to the Beat of Autism. She's also the employment services manager at Thriving Now, a community council member at Autistic Adults and Other Stakeholders Engaged Together, and an independent autistic peer reviewer on the journal Autism in Adulthood. She's currently attending the University of Wollongong in Australia for a master in autism in the areas of education and employment. We also have with us today Dr. Leanne holliday Willey one of the multiple women writers who contributed to the book Autism um, Spectrum Women, um, and she is a developmental delay consultant at Behavioral Resources and Institute for Neuropsychological Services, or BRAINS. She's written multiple books, first of which, Pretending to be Normal, Living with Asperger's Syndrome. And Dr. Holiday Willie runs Kirkshire Farm, an equine boarding and training facility that she owns and runs in Sparta, Michigan. She has a doctor of education with a specialty in psycholinguistics, and does learning style differences from Mississippi State University. We have Ms. Dina Gassner, who's another one of the contributing authors of the book Spectrum Women. After spending 20 years navigating systems for her autistic son and providing consulting services to transitioning youth and adults on the autism spectrum, Dina is in the dissertation phase of her PhD in social work at Adelphi University. She's also an adjunct professor at the Department of Social Work at Adelphi and is working as an adjunct, teaching for the post-baccalaureate certificate program in autism studies at Towson University. She's also participated in working groups of the Federal Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, or IACC. And then finally, Ms. Jennifer O'Toole, the author of Autism in Heels, the untold story of a female life on the autism spectrum, as well as the Asper Kids book series and Sisterhood of the Spectrum. She is also the Senior Directorial Consul uh, Consultant at Jen Jefferson University Medical Center's newly established Center for Autism and Neurodiversity. Ms. O'Toole graduated from Brown University and went on to the Graduate School of Social Work at Columbia University and a Graduate School of Education at Queens University. So these are our four speakers, and I'd also like to take a moment to introduce um, Mr. John Elder Robeson, who's a member of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, who wanted to be here to give a special welcome to our speakers. And this will be followed by a welcome from the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, Dr. Um, Gordon, who is going to give us uh, a welcome on video because he couldn't be here, unfortunately, in person due to a schedule conflict. But he wanted to give a personal welcome to everyone who's watching this special event. So, John. Hello, and thank you all for joining us, both here and online. Um, as an autistic person, and uh, as a person who has had the honor of uh, representing the autism community on a variety of government committees these many years, um, I'd like to just take a moment to remind all of you of the vital roles that women have played in autism advocacy and the sea change that we're seeing in their role today. When I was a boy growing up, it was women in language lab and women in therapy groups that helped me to find my way. Just as the overwhelming majority of people who have delivered autism services to what is now millions of kids in public schools in America, the vast majority 
of those people have been dedicated women. It is women who brought us the committees in government that serve you today. I am always uh, reminded in my autism advocacy that the very existence of committees like the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee is the result of passionate women advocating for their children with autism. You know what's interesting is so many of these women advocating for children, the children were diagnosed and, and just as I experienced in my own family, my son's mother said, well, you can't be autistic. That's nuts. If anyone's autistic, it's me, and I'm not autistic. And of course, 10 years later, she was diagnosed with autism alongside me. What we now see is that starting with a generation of women who advocated for their children, so many of those women saw the same autism in themselves. And we are now experiencing this fundamental time of transition where instead of women standing up here advocating for their children, they are now also standing up here and advocating for themselves. And when they advocate for themselves, many of them do so with the knowledge both of being a child and being a parent and now being an autistic person, that is a really, really powerful thing. And I think as more autistic women move into advocacy on behalf of themselves and the community, you're going to see great things in, in autism. And, and I just want to welcome you and to thank you for joining us. And, and I want to just make sure everyone knows what a great thing that is here at NIH today, and I'm proud to be part of it. Welcome to the NIMH Autism Awareness Month special event, A Woman's Voice, Understanding Autistic Needs. I'm Joshua Gordon, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, the premier federal agency that sponsors research into mental illnesses. NIMH has a robust portfolio of autism-related research, including research on the biology of autism, the diagnosis, the treatment, and other services that address the needs of individuals on the autism spectrum from birth through adulthood. We're proud to acknowledge April as Autism Awareness Month a month dedicated to promoting awareness, acceptance, and understanding of autism through presidential and congressional declarations, special federal, state, and local events, and this particular event held here at the NIH to recognize the needs of individuals on the autism spectrum who are female. During Autism Awareness Month more generally, we recognize the contributions of individuals with autism, of family members, caregivers, advocates, the medical community, researchers, and educators who all combine to try to improve the lives of individuals on the spectrum and their families. World Autism Day was internationally recognized on April 2nd. It is a day where the member states of the United Nations are encouraged to take measures to raise awareness about autism throughout the world. But today's event is about women and girls with autism. It's really important that we begin to discuss this particular issue because although the ratio of boys to girls is about four to one, that is, for every, every one girl with autism, there are about four boys with, diagnosed with autism, recent studies suggest that we really don't understand as much about autism in women and girls as we do about that in boys. Thank you again for your attendance, and I'm really excited to be able to introduce this event, and sorry to miss it in person. Thank you. I'll introduce our first speaker, Ms. Barb Cook, who's going to share with us a little bit about Spectrum Women. Autistic pride. This is where it all started one fateful evening, June 2017. Our book, Spectrum Women, Walking to the Beat of Autism, 
had its humble beginnings from a conversation by some of the writers of the team from the Spectrum Women online magazine. Autistic Pride Day was fast approaching and it was suggested by Ian Perkis, formerly Jeanette, that we should write a collaboration of stories on what autistic pride meant. It was halfway through this conversation that for some reason I had an idea pop in my head that we should all write a book together. Hell, we do have a lot to offer. We are all on the autism spectrum, plus we have experience, years and decades of experience sitting within us, and it needed to be shared. I said to Renata, one of our writers, that it gave me a light bulb moment that we should all write the book together and maybe call it Spectrum Women. It took a lot of thinking in giving that title, <laughs> where we can all give our personal insights, like one of those self-help empowerment books, but for fellow autistic women. At that point, midway through our discussion, I didn't realise I'd set the wheels in motion on a train down a hill without any brakes. The idea of the book took a whole enormous life of its own. Within hours, we had a proposal to Jessica of Jessica Kingsley Publishers and how much the women and identifying women on the spectrum needed a candid, honest and open-hearted book written by those who get them, live a life like them and want to share with them that we don't need to navigate this life alone. The number of ideas for the book was immense and the topics became tailored into chapters to cover what we felt were essential to start this mission. Now, mind you, keeping on this word of mission, and I need to um, talk about this, is reminiscent of a Bond movie. M, who is Maura Campbell, that was one of the writers of the book, became my left-handed, because I'm left-handed, it's not right-handed person, <laughs> sidekick and woman behind my sanity, my sounding board, and my second pair of eyes. My friend with a dark sense of humour that you needed a torch. A person who helped me make it all the way to the end. Without M, I don't think I could have pulled this all together as brilliantly as we did. And this wasn't a paid advertisement. There's a lot of considerations to take into account when pulling a book like this together. And I'm sure there will be parts that some of you may not agree with, and that is fine. We all have our insights personal views which make us different. We embrace that. Keeping this in mind, we tried to encompass a wide diversity of thought and writing styles we used while embracing our own personal choices. The academic side of this book was something we wanted to embrace alongside with our personal accounts. Even though women of the book are the experts, we needed to ensure that health professionals, researchers and the academic community listened and embraced what we had to offer from our own experiences and insights. Dr Michelle Garnett complements each chapter of our book, giving her own views from her clinical experience and research around women and girls on the autism spectrum. Dr Garnett's unique gift of over 20 years' experience working in the field, alongside with Professor Tony Atwood, shines through with each chapter and replies, as she provides commentary on. Dr Garnett brings forth to the readers the value and worth of each autistic female and identifying individuals have to offer while providing demonstrated strategies in creating a more feeling, fulfilling life. Information and personal journeys within this book are from our own unique perception and experience of the world around us. Each of us live in different circumstances making no two stories alike. But we share a common theme, to give you, the reader, a glimpse into our lives. And I'm sure you will all feel a connection, whether it's with all of us or just one or two. Even the smallest amount of information, wisdom or insight, can set you on a different path of personal happiness and certainly make this project all that worthwhile. For me, I, when I was di diagnosed six weeks before my 40th birthday, I was at a point in my life where I was totally broken. I'd given up on life and I resided myself to never fitting in and the world didn't want me. It wasn't until I went to a health and wellness uh, event at my local uh, town, I saw a local GP there speaking 
on about how to look after yourself and self-care. Her words saw through my pain and into my soul. After she spoke, I couldn't wait to talk to her, tell her I was crazy, but a huge connection to her words. She told me I wasn't crazy to come and see her, and from that moment, my life began to turn around in ways I could never have dreamed of. It just takes a moment like this to completely change your world, set you on a path to find yourself again. I know so many ladies who are getting diagnosed later in life and the impact it has, and not just on understanding ourselves, it literally is life-changing. It does take some time to rediscover who you are. After what seems like a lifetime of never understanding the world, let alone yourself, you have to take the time to go back and reflect on your life to move forward. So there I was, a middle-aged woman who basically was starting life over again. I had to untrain all the misconceptions of how I should behave, what was expected, and to let go of what other people thought. That was a hard one. But my past made a lot more sense. When you don't understand yourself, it is hard to accept not just what is happening, but why it's happening. It is virtually impossible to rationalise with yourself when you don't understand why you feel such an outsider and an alien. But it does change. So where does the story begin? With you. It doesn't have to start at the beginning and it doesn't have to feel as it's all over before you got a chance to begin. It's never too late to find happiness. That is our ultimate goal. To find peace within, to find where we belong and to be valued for who we are. Now, I was heading on to 50 at the time, I now made 50 a week ago. I've finally transitioned into another phase of my life. Now, 10 years later, I can actually say I emerged on the other side, a light at the end of the tunnel. But where do we go now about this? How can we bring happiness into our lives if we're feeling so entrenched in a system that doesn't work for us? We have to reach out and ask for our tribe. Stop trying to fit into everyone else's expectations. Take a step back, reevaluate, and rebuild your life your way. It's okay to reflect on what could have been, but don't stay there. As with many women who are identified later in life, comes experience. And it's from this experience that we certainly know what doesn't work for us. It's time to find out what does. Within the pages of our book, it's a lifetime experience waiting to be shared by you, by women just like you. The Spectrum women know your pain, your challenges, your heartache. They've been there, survived, embraced and evolved. Imparting their wisdom, the Spectrum women open up a doorway for you to step through, out into a new way of thinking and loving yourself for who you truly are. A step on a journey for you to explore. But don't think of a moment that this book is designed just for those who of us have been on this path for years or decades. This book is for all ages and all points of the journey you are on. Whether you are just at the beginning or have just been travelling this path for some time, the Spectrum women welcome you into our lives. As we say, the front door is open, the kettle is on. Come on in, you are welcome, you are home. Thank you so much, Barb, for that introduction to your book. And next, I'd like to have Jennifer O'Toole come up and talk about her book. I walk around ADD. I have that. So um, I hope it's all right that you'll allow me to kind of address you in just a little bit of a different way. Um, I feel very blessed to be following Barb. Um, so I call her Babs because we've known each other for, online for a very long while. Um, and I love how today we are bringing to you the same story, but in incredibly different ways. 
Spectrum Women is obviously a collection, and it's meant to be just that. My story for Autism and Heels, well, it doesn't necessarily begin at a GP's office or um, in a wonderful conversation with colleagues. Largely, it begins in bathrooms. Um, and here's why. Men, you'll notice that a lot of the time, women go to bathrooms you know, in groups, and you all want to know why. It's, the truth is that ladies' rooms are sort of um, equaling, equal playing fields. It's a, it's a leveling off place where, you know, at any point you might have to borrow a, a lipstick or some toilet paper or a tampon or whatever the case may be. We are real there. There's no pretense. And everyone has to sort of be herself. In 2011, after my three children, where I like to say identified instead of diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. I always think diagnosed sounds so very, well, illness related. But you can identify your favorite song. You can identify the love of your life. Um, so first my daughter and then my two sons. And me and their dad as well. Well, the thing is that it didn't go quite so simply, step one, two, three, were five. What did go simply, oddly, was that several months after they were diagnosed, I had a bunch of their clinicians saying to me, you really need to write a book. No, start a school for these kids. And I'm going, I have a seven, a four, and a one-year-old. I don't know when you expect me to do that, but thanks anyway. And then they said, well, how about you maybe write a book instead? Because I think they said three in one week, which they say is supposed to be the angels talking to you, that basically, well, the direct quote, you could change the way this world understands and treats people with autism, especially the kids. OK, what person's going to say no to that, right? So I did. And I sat down one summer, three weeks, and had absolutely no expectations of anything happening. And I wrote something that I called Asper Kids. And I sent it in to the publisher. Originally, it was JKP as well. And this was a Monday. Wednesday, I had an email from Jessica Kingsley, well, from Jessica, not knowing who this Jessica might be, and um, asking for the rest of the manuscript. Did I have it? I said, yes, I do. Who is, yeah, I realized this is, no, this is the CEO, not an intern. Sent the rest of that manuscript. And by Friday, I had a contract. That doesn't happen. I would like to apologize right now for social challenge number one. I, can, I find it very difficult to walk that fine line between sharing the extraordinary events that have happened in my life over the last only seven years and sounding, well, arrogant or full of myself, because that's not what I feel. What I feel is completely astounded completely astounded and completely certain that the things that are happening in my life with my work are only because I'm saying things that other people are recognizing in their own, their own lives, their own hearts. So in short succession, there were six more books, well, a total of six. It did wildly well, took me to amazing places, meeting amazing people with Everything being, everything that I did, being set firmly on the foundation of awesomeness. That was my word, every which way. I guess I say it a lot anyway, apparently. But it was, if learning's not fun, you're doing it wrong. And let's be different together. Things that I truly believe in. My optimism is real. And yes, Susan said I should do this. So I'll show you the kind of presenter and person I am. When in England, before 300, no, 800 people on a large, large stage with two jumbotrons behind me and one of the um, members of the royal family in front, my, the gal who was going to introduce me on the other side of the stage had the little bio on my laptop was over there and I'm way over here and I'm hoping I'm not going to have a fashion emergency here. But um, <laughs> so she's about to introduce me. She needs to do a little housekeeping first and then she says, Oops, I'm so sorry, um, Jennifer, Jennifer, it's gone to sleep. Can you help me? And this is what I did across the stage. <laughs> Maybe that's not what you think of when you think of someone with autism. 
And that's kind of the point. You see, I think inclusion, inclusion is, uh, well, inclusion is not a goal. Inclusion, inclusion, I think, more often than not, is a wonderful excuse to congratulate ourselves, pat ourselves on the back and say, in a nice condescending voice, isn't that great? We've made sure everyone's allowed on the playground. Well, do you want to be the kid who's included? Like, hey, did you include him when you invited everybody in the class to your party? Or do you want to be wanted? That's what this is about. And I realized that in all the work that I was doing, which was real, and which honestly was keeping me going through some of the hardest times in my life, that there needed to be more to it. Because I thought about how much harder I had had to work for my daughter's identification. But when it came to her brothers, it was so simple. And I was looking back through my own life and realizing what I had had to do was, well, honestly, fight like hell to be recognized, to be understood. Because in my life, I have, subsequent to the challenges that come along with autism, I have been raped and beaten and ostracized. I have been excluded. I have starved myself into the hospital. I have been lonely. I have been suicidal. I have also been joyous and giggly and triumphant in moments of glitter and kitchen dance parties with my kids. All of those are parts of autism. And I realized that in all my Asper kids' work, in all that that was offering to the world, and does, and I'm so glad there was more. And in fact, John Ella Robeson actually said to me once, I think you need to write me in the eye, like the girl's version. <laughs> and I didn't really know what that meant, but I figured, well, he's a smart guy. <laughs> he knows some stuff. The truth was, though, I didn't know what it was that I needed to put out there. And I'll tell you what it was, because I figured it out finally. There is a story where Ginger Rogers said, or was asked rather, is it difficult keeping up with Fred Astaire? And she said, well, no, not really. I do it backwards and in high heels. So to me, this is the story of another Ginger adding to the dance in heels, autism in heels. I told you about the bathrooms. That's where I figured out what it was I'm supposed to say. I had told my daughter before she came with me to a conference, sweetie, I just want you to know, watch out. When I'm done talking, there's going to be a flood to the bathroom. And she first thought I just meant because, you know, too much coffee. No. What she realized and saw was that every single time I was heading to the restroom afterwards, women and girls were following me. I came here today for my students, my husband, my son, my whatever, except as you're speaking, I'm hearing my story. I'm starting to understand that maybe I've not been so smart but so stupid my whole life long. That maybe I'm not defective and broken and unwanted and a cheap excuse for something else. Maybe I'm exactly what I'm meant to be. And I just need to figure out how to do that well. Because in the end, ladies and gentlemen, Normal and typical are not synonyms. We're taught that they are, but they are not. Our hearts are wide open. There is a we too in the me too movement that is so desperately forgotten. Eating disorders, self-harm, cutting, um, depression, profoundly debilitating anxiety, huge disparity between academic potential and uh, professional achievement or life satisfaction, and terrible, terrible repeated rounds of intimate violence, intimate abuse, intimate neglect. Because the reality is, when you are told from the very beginning that above all, you are just too much. You are too much this and too much that. You are too intense, 
you are too hard to take, you are tiring, you go on and on and on in circles when a conversation, especially in women's relationships, they're meant to be concise and well-timed and witty and snappy, only when we know how to imitate them but can't intuitively, in the real moment, be improvisational, we blow it. And as we get older, those explosions and those letdowns get bigger and bigger, like maybe when you walk in to ask for a raise and instead are let go. I realize that you look at me, there are some things perhaps that you think or may think, well, she's not this or she's not that. She's, she's not really autistic. No, I'm not autistic overtly like every person is, but I'm just wondering if you were to stand me up to, next to any other woman in this room, would we look identical and would that make either one of us less or more of a woman? No. The basic inherent traits and experiences of being autistic, they are within each one of us because when it comes down to it, I am much more like any person on the spectrum whether that is a person who cannot reach his or her words and get them out to you than I am like any neurotypical person. I am loquacious and babbly because I am trying to get past my anxiety and desperately hope that you will understand what I'm saying or like me or want to bring me along or at the very least not break my heart. Because when you think you are too difficult to love, you will love for crumbs and you will take it all because we are primed from the time we are little children. That if you tell me that, you know, that's not green and I'm looking at it and I'm seeing a green chair, but my whole life long I have to learn how to somehow function where what I see and experience isn't what everybody else does, well then it becomes pretty easy to hear that everything else that I'm saying is wrong too. Or, you know, like happened to me, be completely left without friends, have you be, be, the, be the one that everyone else wants to leave out of the games to the point of huge pranks and school-wide humiliation where teachers just as happily jump in on the grooming process because they will take advantage of what you can do. And there are many ways to be taken advantage of, especially when you're a girl. And as you grow, when I was in high school, there was a young man who used to stand at my locker every single day and tell me to go home and kill myself because no one wanted me there anyway. And in college, I went to two Ivy League schools. I was a cheerleader. I was in a sorority. Scientific American described me in that sense as exactly what you don't think of with autism. And isn't that the point of us all standing here? Before we began today, I told John the story of Temple Grandin rolling around in my hotel room doing sciatica butt stretches, as she put it. <laughs> rolling back and forth and back and forth, and she rolled over a pair of my heels. And she said, Jennifer, I don't know how you can wear these things. They're terrible. And I said, it's OK, Temple. I'm pretty sure I can't rock the bolo tie like you can. There is room enough for all of us in this conversation. And I go back to the idea that inclusion that's just a starting place. It's not the goal. And whether that means in the conversation of autism, in the conversation of humanity, good for us. Good for us, we want to get past the idea of tolerance and, and yay, we want to celebrate diversity. But do we really? Do we really look at each of the other people, at other people who seem not quite like us and do something more than going, oh, isn't that good? You're here too. Do we really genuinely believe that there's something to listen to? Because I don't believe it is as much about the autism spectrum as it is about the human spectrum. And in Autism and Heals, my story comes down to this. It is those honest, gentle, timid, vulnerable dances in between the spaces of knowing what and how the world has told you that you are, and the possibility of being something so much better, not by doing, just by being, that's, that's the experience. In this book, there are stories of some of the worst 
most humiliating moments of my life, things that are not in my happy, uplifting, important books from before. There are stories of a woman whose 30-something-year-old daughter had recently died of anorexia, and the mom had read that Scientific American article about me and said, oh my gosh, this is my daughter. I recognize her. I think that she was on the spectrum. The grandchild was, but it had never been acknowledged or recognized with the daughter. And her heart was broken to find that it was too late. And she thought she had never known her daughter, but here's the beautiful thing. I was getting ready to go out and do a talk for her in memory of her daughter when she found a picture from her daughter's last Facebook post about her very last birthday. And among the pictures of the gifts that she had there was one of my books. And it was the secret book of social rules. It says for teens and tweens. But most of the readers are adults. Because I wrote it for myself and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I said to her, do you realize that Catherine didn't get that for her son? Her son was five. She got it for herself. And the magical moment was in realizing that the mother had seen her daughter and the daughter had seen herself both in someone who was not extraordinary, but just very much like them. And Rebecca, the mother, has said, if only they had known. If only they had known the stories that we can tell you, her daughter would be alive. But the experts don't see us because what they see and they recognize are the patterns described by looking at little boys, primarily in pre-war Vienna. I'm a mom in a bra and a minivan. It's not so much the same, but the innate needs being served are the same. So I guess I say to you, through all of this, I offer you the reality of all that I've done before, but in heels, what I hope to offer as well is the most private, raw, real story of what it is to dance backwards in heels, to take you along for the ride and to say, you know, kick them up because whether you're doing it in Crocs or you're doing it in a sensible suit, or you're doing it in the best dang set of stilettos you've ever seen. I don't care how you do women, and I do not care how you do autism, as long as we do it real together, different together. Thank you. So thank you, Jennifer, for that nice introduction to your book. Now we're going to have some time for a conversation with our authors and editors. And after we have that conversation, we'll have some time for the audience to ask questions. When did you first know that there was something unique about you that made you different from others? And anyone can answer these questions who feels comfortable. I think subconsciously, I always knew something was different. Um, I'd go to parties and I never wanted to be with the other kids. I didn't want the other kids sharing my things, touching my dog, jumping in my pool, looking at my parents. And I noticed there was a herd mentality and then there was me. But I didn't really understand that I was as different as I am neurologically until, as John had mentioned earlier, my daughter was diagnosed. And then I was able to figure it out. That one? Okay, great. Um, I would definitely agree with Leanne. It was, to me, it was, it was an always thing, um, not knowing what, though. And I think we do a really good job of saying, well, it's this, that, or the other thing. And for me, I was an only child, so it's, well, she hangs around with adults a lot. Or she's, you know, she's really smart, so that's just her sounding like a little professor. Ironically, the exact same term that Hans Asperger used when describing the little boys with whom he was working, but nobody made that you know association. So, but um, but but yeah, that's um, the way we play is different and uh, just doesn't look differently enough, I think, for a lot of times for the um, not well-informed experts to recognize.
Um, for me, it probably was in my primary school years um, is probably when I really realised because I wasn't anything like the rest of the girls. I wanted to be like the rest of the boys. I thought, yeah, I want my BMX bike. That's what started me on my motorcycling because then I could go faster. Um, but I, I often question myself because, like, why do, why do the other girls don't want to climb trees with me or, you know, do all sorts of, you know, what all these boys were doing? And the guys actually talked far more sense than the girls ever did. So, yeah, it was probably through those years. And I even questioned myself when I was around about nine years old. And I thought to myself, because I've got two brothers, and I thought, maybe I was supposed to be a boy. It's just somehow got really screwed up here and I ended up being a girl because I think like a guy, but I don't. But... Yeah, so it was really, really quite interesting. Yeah, through them younger years, I always knew I was so much different um, to everybody else. So, yeah. I would just say that um, I was immersed in trying to get my hands around the information I would need to have to advocate for my son who uh, was diagnosed at three, very male, externalized expression. I don't use high and low functioning. I think it does a disservice to everybody. I use internalizing and externalizing. And he was much more externalizing. He was symptomatic, easily to capture. And so he started very early on in early intervention, got everything we could give him. And then I read a book called Pretending to be Normal, and I met this woman next to me, and for the first time, I was able to see an image that reflected me rather than the more externalized expression of my son. And so it allowed me to start asking those questions about, um, you know, and I never felt different or uh, inadequate, but I was a little bewildered when I would mimic the behaviors of other people. And I want to back up and say I don't believe in masking. <laughs> I know that's not going to be popular today. I believe everybody masks. Do you wear the same personality for margaritas with your girlfriends as you wear at your job interview, right? Everybody masks. What I'll say is it's effortful for us. And so I would, you know, do what I saw other people doing, but I kept getting bad outcomes, and I had no idea why. I never sent, you know, said, oh, I'm a horrible, awful person. You know, I have a lot of confidence, and that never happened. But I was, like, geeky, confused, and bewildered about it. And so from networking with the people we now call family, Leanne, Valerie Paradis's book, Elijah's Cup, was very informative for me. I began, because I couldn't look, look at Temple's books and see myself reflected there, were very different. So it wasn't until I met these other women that I started to recognize the potential for me being on the spectrum. And I think, uh, let's just go down the road. I was 38. Uh, about 36. Oh, sorry. About 36. Six weeks before 40. Yeah. So that's a lot of years of bewilderment, but I experienced what Babs experienced this co sense of completion, um, uh, a sense of understanding. And from that foundation of self awareness and being able to take the diagnosis off the page and put it in real time, you're then able to ask for accommodations, which is something none of us enjoyed, right, until the very, very bitter end. So you're looking at a table full of resilient, you know, determined, heels in the ground, women who just never gave up. So, so do any of you want to share more about what your experience of being identified with autism was like, how that changed your life? For me, that was everything. It was the most life-changing, eye-opening, tears of relief <laughs> moment that I can honestly recall. Um, it was unzipping life and making sense of it all in reverse. Um, because suddenly, Again, as I said before, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't deficient at being something I wasn't meant to be in the first place. I could figure out things. I could start writing down a list of social rules that everybody else seemed to know that I didn't. The irony in, in that one is that's what became the 
book that it won book of the year and I thought nobody was ever going to read it because nobody would care because nobody else needed these tips. The fact is we all maybe need a, some tips in, in, in getting along and, and seeing things, you know, for, so to me, oh gosh, it was the kindest, most gracious thing that could ever, ever have happened. Yeah. Mom's well, a little bit different and probably quite common for most women. I was misdiagnosed originally. And that actually probably did more detriment than it did good for me because I was researching about myself. And again, I'm same as Dina. Leanne was one of my first books and changed my life. And I went into the psychologist that I saw at the particular time that misdiagnosed me, didn't believe me. No, you're not this. You're too too emotional, you're too um, extreme. No, you have bipolar disorder, this is what you have, and social phobia, this is why you don't like people. And it wasn't until, like I said um, before, I went to this um, event, and because I just thought oh, I'd given up even more by then, going, all right, I've resigned myself, there's just something sort of so, I can never get my life together. And when I spoke to this doctor and said about what I'd been diagnosed, and she just went, no, you're definitely not. This, you're definitely not. So I went and saw her and then went to see a psychiatrist that actually knew something about autism, and more specifically autism in women. And I walked out of that office um, at that time, ten, yeah, over 10 years ago, um, with Asperger's syndrome, um, ADHD and dyslexia. And that really made a whole lot of sense what was going on. And once you start to understand yourself, it really does turn your life around. You can then stop going, right, I don't have to be like the rest of the people out there. I can take hold of myself, I can embrace who I am, and I'm not going to try to fit in anymore. Can I just ask a question? Because I know, Dina, you heard this and I did too. I, I think all of us were at first misdiagnosed with bipolar, if it's not endemic, it is, it is something that is thrown, it, it is such an incredibly common process along the way for women to be first misidentified as bipolar. Um, I know when I was hospitalized for anorexia in my 20s, that's what they assigned me and the, the doctor I asked about racing thoughts and I was telling you this yesterday and he said, you know, well, if we were, <laughs> if we were cars on a highway and our thoughts were both the cars, how fast would you be going? And first of all, the mind blindness that I, I don't, how, I don't know, how fast is your car? What's the speedometer? This was crazy. And then also I kept thinking, maybe I'm just smarter than you. And that's why I'm thinking fast. But seriously, there was, as Dina pointed out last <laughs> night, <story>. no psychosis. <laughs> No psychosis. Um, yeah, I, um, I had been sexually abused as a young girl. So everything that was wrong with my life was bastardized into it being trauma. What no one looked at is why there was a distinct pattern. I was sexually abused by a step-parent. Then I was sexually abused by not one, not two, not three, but four clergymen over a period of six years. And nobody looked at that for the vulnerability and the naivete that was underlying it. Like there were so many signs, but again, this is not what they were looking for. Um, the other thing we have to know about misdiagnoses that's really critical, the number one most common first misdiagnosis for autism is ADHD. If you get an ADHD diagnosis, they give you stimulants. If they give you stimulants and you don't have ADHD, or you're autistic and you receive chemicals in a high intensity, you begin to develop other behaviors that they don't like. So then they give you another pill. And then they give you another pill. So by the time they changed my diagnosis from bipolar to autism, I was on 14 different psychiatric drugs. Being autistic never disabled me, but trying to be normal nearly killed me. You know, and now that I'm old and I have a diagnosis and I can prepare every day of my life to consider my autism, now I'm on something to help me sleep at night, which I later figured out was my Achilles heel and high blood pressure medicine because I'm pretty type A. Um, so you can imagine the years of misdiagnoses that young children and now adult women diagnosed with bipolar, personality disorders, another one, the, the, the treatment 
destroys us. So getting a proper diagnosis is the key. It's the key to health and wellness for us. I, I have just a funny little story. My daughter was in a two-day clinical, eight hours, six hours a day evaluation service, and when she was finished, the clinicians looked at me, I, I think because I pointed out to someone that their brooch was the most ugly thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> And they had talked to me for two days and said, you know, we think you need to get a diagnosis. And sure enough, I ran into Dr. Tony Atwood and long story short, wrote the book and blah, blah, blah. I received not one but two but three diagnoses because I kept saying, but I don't look like Rain Man. And this was early on. So after my diagnosis, my father was diagnosed in his 60s. And our solution was to say, now we know what's wrong with everybody, not us, all those People called normal there. That look at look how they're doing. Why are they acting that way? And so we felt we were among the honored population, and I still feel that way today. So, can you tell me a little bit about what unique challenges you think you've faced as women on the spectrum that men who are on the spectrum don't face? So, I would feel very uncomfortable moving forward if we don't have this conversation. And that is, although we're talking about autistic women here, there are many, many male children and male adults who present in this different kind of internalizing phenotype. And so, I think that any kind of gender binary, you know, there's people who are gender non-binary, there are people who are transgender, who live under a double rainbow with two coming outs, right? You know, they come out as autistic and they come out as LGBTQ or transitional. And when we do these binaries, we risk leaving people out, you know, because nothing in life is binary. We're learning that. So I just want to, like, make that like a caveat for the day. But, you know, I think that uh, for me, as somebody who's an extrovert on steroids, like the bell curve is there, my son's on the introverted to a fault end, I'm on the other end. And being an extrovert on steroids means that I come across as very direct and, and, and I, I ask questions with statements. And it's interesting, men don't have a problem with that, but many, many, many women struggle with very directive communication because of some prior trauma that they've experienced. So I, you know, now that I'm, it's really funny, all in my 30s, women are about fluff and about recipes and about children, and I just wanted to, like, die because I had nothing in common with them. And then all my friends went through the change, and now they're, like, direct and straightforward, and they want to leave a legacy. And now I have more friends than I've ever had in my life, and I really haven't changed, but my female friends have transitioned into a different phase of their life that I was already in. So it's been really exciting now to have this autistic family. I have a lot of family in New York now where I live that are not autistic people, but they support me in a way that I've never experienced. Um, you know, my, I, I just, women just go through a different phase of development. You know, um, women, women change multiple times. We wear multiple identities. And I think that may be unique to women, not just women with autism, but women in general, you know. Anyone else have a comment on that particular question? I just want to follow up with um, what Dina said about with um, gender. Um, what I've found has happened with our book that we've written. We've had a lot of different people, not just women, um, non-binary. I've had males. I've had all sorts of people um, send emails and comment saying, this applies to me. So, yeah, even though it says it's Spectrum Women, this book is basically for everyone and anyone. I, I would... Uh, that I do that right? I completely concur, um, again, to that human spectrum. Um, I know my, my daughter has um, several friends who, um, you know, identify as gender fluid or are trans or... And... and what we have found is that sometimes it's actually very helpful um, to understand that wherever your biology or psychology is headed, sometimes where you began also is part of the expression too. So honestly, I think the whole point that we're all trying to make, I think, is that none of us want to take away from that which is already understood about autism. We want to add to the conversation, not say, eh, eh, just add to it because there are unique 
there are unique um, bits that have to be included if we do a good job saying this is autism. So what strengths do you think you have because of your autism? I can ride a motorbike really well. <laughs> um, actually, the, one of the reasons why I ride a motorbike as well is it helps with my anxiety. Um, it's a really big stress relief. And also, when I'm on my motorbike, I'm not clumsy anymore. When my feet are on the ground, the furniture hates me, and the walls and the doors and anything else. So that's where I find my superpower is when I'm on my bike. I no longer feel that everything is going to, like the furniture, throw itself at me. I can actually move. I feel graceful, and I feel like I'm in my own little world. I've got my helmet on. Nobody can talk to me. It's the perfect space to be in. So for me, that is, that is my superpower is because of my motorbike. I think um, I, it's pretty well known that people with autism have great observational powers. We make great architects and doctors and people looking, as my father was an engineer, a testing engineer, looking for flaws in things. Um, I think having almost a photographic memory, and in my case, I can remember everything I've seen, but how to apply it, well, that's a whole different story. Um, I think we have a great... Uh, uh, loyalty skills. Once we like you, we like you forever. And if we hate you, eh, whatever. You know, we don't care so much. We tend to be uh, very, we've discussed this earlier, we tend to be empathics. You want to take that? Sure. Um, it's, it's a big rumor that autistic people don't have empathy. But what we're having a conversation recently in community about is how many of us are actually empaths. And the reason we shut down in a room full of energy is not because we don't feel anything, it's because we feel everything. And so I do really think that, um, you know, that's something people don't understand. It's a great myth we need to bust. I would say um, I have two, probably two superpowers. One is an, an inordinate capacity to dig deep and understand how systems work so that people can navigate them. It's a very unique talent I'm finding out. And for me, it was just a problem-solving strategy thing, but it's really unique. Um, and I also have a capacity, you, you hear the word echolalia, but you think about it being mirrored language from someone, where you say, hi, John, and they say, hi, John, right back to you. But everything I'm speaking to you today is echolalia. Everything I'm saying today, I've said before in exactly the same way. So unless we go have drinks, you may not ever know that. But this is, and I've never rehearsed it. I have a unique capacity to borrow language from other environments and use it in a way that's very productive for me. So when you, you know, I hear parents say, my kid has echolalia and nothing he says makes any sense. I'm like, oh, yes, it does. You just don't know the movie. <laughs> right? You haven't watched that Disney movie close enough because he's communicating or she's communicating with you. So um, I think that would be my other superpower is I have this ability to use language in a way that seems to be very bridge building, I think. So tell us about what it's been like sharing your personal experiences being on the autism spectrum so publicly through your writing and public speaking. What has that been like for you and how has that changed your life? It's been really great, actually. I'm really glad I've told the world who I am, rather than pretending who I wasn't supposed to be. Um, I have no problem with it whatsoever. I've not had any ne negative feedback from it. The only problem was is um, family. They didn't embrace who I was at all. And it came down to a point a few years ago where I basically have cut off all of my family because it was better for my well-being to do that and to live the life the way I wanted it, not how they used to perceive who I was, going, no, there's nothing wrong with you. That's how you've always been. We love you for who you are. Well, no, you didn't. You didn't want to know who I was. You didn't know all the struggles I had to put up with. So turning it around like that and then also telling the world through the book and through the writing and the connections with the other um, women as well within our writers' group... Um, it's a very empowering thing to be able to do that, is to be just so very, very open about who I am. It takes away so much of that fear of who I used to think I was, that I was this defective person. It's taken away everything there now, and I just can be exactly who I want to be.
for me, I think it's, um, it's an interesting relationship. Um, made my relationships more authentic. Um, it's enabled me to extricate myself from situations that weren't healthy um, in ways that maybe I would not have otherwise because I always did want to. Um, I was the perfectionist, so fit all the, tick all the boxes, do it all right, be the good girl. And um, sometimes, sometimes safer, healthier doesn't walk that line. Um, for me also, I think it's made me a better mother. Uh, it's made me a more authentic <sighs> liver of life. Um, and I think the best thing for me is that uh, recently my daughter was asked um, to write about um, someone who inspires her. And, and, and at 16, that is not a guarantee it's going to be your parent. In fact, usually, you know, <laughs> it can be the opposite. But she did, and, and she wrote about me, and what she wrote is she wrote that I have inspired her to seek and cultivate wonder and curiosity in the world. And I think that that's my autistic superpower, is that I promised myself to not forget what it was like to be a kid, and that means not forgetting what it is to be overwhelmed or scared, unsure, and also super excited to just be and bubble and ask and wonder, because curiosity in a relationship is a beautiful thing. So, yeah, that. So what advice do you have for parents of girls on the autism spectrum, and particularly speaking from your own experience as mothers? Um, so my father and I formed, as I said, a little team. We called it Team Aspie. This was before the new DSM, and Asperger's Syndrome was still part of the deal. And we just wanted um, everyone, particularly my daughter, to know that who you are is who you are, and we love you the way you are. And you will go to college, even though the universities told us you wouldn't. And you will, or if not college, something. You'll become something. Her first diagnosis was um, this child is not, is not, is not, is not, is not, is not. And this was very early on. I don't think we use those terms in that kind of dialogue anymore. But we filled her mind with your potential is infinite. And you'll do what you want to do and we'll support you the whole way. And she has and she is and she still has her struggles, but she gets through them with friends and support and family. And I think just giving that self-esteem boost that you can, you will. If we could all do that to everybody we meet everywhere, boy, what a lift we'd be giving to the world, autism or not. I think one of the greatest harms we do is telling autistic people that they need to outgrow things. You don't outgrow autism, you grow into it. And, you know, um, you know, there's a gap between your functional IQ and your performance. Like, there's always a gap for autistic people um, in that your, your executive function, your working memory, your social issues, your anxiety, something is creating this gap in your performance outcomes. But it's the accommodations, the modifications, the self-awareness, and the maximizing of support options that closes the gap. But with kids who are invisibly autistic, we start delineating, you don't need that. You don't need that. Yet when I look, adults are using calendars just like the kids are using schedules. Why do we, you know, stigmatize that, right? So I can tell you that I've been able to accomplish all my academic coursework, passed all my comps the first time for my PhD at 60, lived in the undergraduate dorm for two years at 56, uh, but I was able to do all of that, not in spite of my autism, but because I completely own my autism now. I know what I need. I have language to ask for what I need. And I think that's where we fall down. We're not teaching autistic kids from the outside in who they are. Because we don't come to it on our own unless we do it through tremendous pain an unreasonable delay. If we were to instead say, congratulations, today you decide, you know, we figured out why you think the way you do and why you're so good at A and why you're so great at B and why C is a little harder, let me teach you about autism. And then we work on how does 
the world experience my autism? And how do I experience the world differently through the lens of autism? And then from that, we build those scaffolded supports. That's where we're going to see less suicide, less depression, less anxiety, more autonomy, more agency, because they know who they are. It's the only identity that we need taught. I had to learn it over 30 years through Stephen Shore, Leanne Willey. Other people need help getting there faster. It shouldn't take 30 years to own that. Can I just quickly say something? I'm not a mother, but I wanted, well, I used to be a mother of two cats. But, um, but I wanted to say as well that it's actually okay if you don't have children. There are so many of us out there that are quite content to be cat lovers, dog lovers, and be parents of furry animals or snakes. Um, you know, it's perfectly okay to say to your family or say to people, go, no, I'm quite okay not to have children. I'm quite happy with how my life is. So I just want to just throw that in there about with parenting and stuff. Um, I think, when I think of my daughter, I there are two things that come to mind that I think are the most important. Uh, one, it's female relationships are always more complicated. Um, they are more nuanced socially, and, uh, um, and there are levels of complexity that um, a neurotypical, we, are, we tend to act more uh, along the lines of a neurotypical male and autistic female brain socially into it's about the level of what a neurotypical male, this is making broad generalities, but this is what some research is showing, but that we're working, that's not our peer set though, right? And so um, that's where we stumble and we fall. We don't know and need to be taught that there are in fact social hierarchies, you know, that somebody you've met once or even twice is not necessarily your friend. You don't respond to them and treat them the same way you would um, as somebody you've known for a long time. We're excellent at identifying what a friend is not. We're not at all good at identifying what a friend is. Um, understanding that, um, other people may have motivations, especially in female relationships where information is the key commodity that is being traded at all times. That, um, that there are roles that people play. Um, once you can start to understand those, um, I know that's a lot of, I know I've, I've written about in some of my other books, but my daughter said that she will sit there and study that because it's, she can then look at a group of people and know who's acting as what and have a better chance of fitting in to it. Um, and then the other thing would be that every single time you, ha you have or see a young woman, an old woman, a middle-aged woman, a, a kid, whatever, where you're seeing self-harm and or eating disorders, that needs to always, always, always be a red flag that there needs to be an autism evaluation, always. Um, because it is, think about it, it's rigidity, it's routine, it's control over anxiety. We are prime candidates, and we like to, we take things out on ourselves because that's where we can change something. Um, and you heard the story I told you before. So those, to me, are the two that jumped out. And, and to not take things literally with boys or girls or whoever ever your relationships are going to be with. Learn to protect yourself as well. So what tips do you have to help girls and women on the autism spectrum succeed in life? To succeed in life, uh, not listen to what neurotypicals tell you and what you should be doing. Be the person who you want to be. You know, it, it's like what I said before, um, stop trying to fit into what society wants. Go out there and do what makes you happy. Do what you're passionate about. You know, yes, there is going to be challenges with society. You know, they've still got a long way to go, to go from this medicalised model to the social model of going, we're not the defective ones, it's the environment that needs to change to support us, to bring out the best in us, and so we can achieve what we want. You know, that's what we need to do. Society's got to look at it differently. 
I once said at a conference I presented at, the number one first trauma we experience is not being believed. You know, when we go to diagnosticians and we present our situation and we have self-assessed and we're looking for confirmation and they say, oh, you couldn't be autistic, fill in the blank. Like, that's our first trauma, right? Um, and I think also in terms of that, we are striving for a neurodiverse social model of disability where we recognize society's failure of accepting us as being our greatest barrier. But I will say in contrast to that, at least in the United States, all of our systems are based on the medical model. So, you know, I just want to see you try to get Social Security declaring yourself neurodiverse. Like, we need these classifications and we need these labels. Uh, for me, I'm fine with the label. I'm autistic, I'm disabled, and it affects me every day. But functionally, we have to use these identifiers in order to get services. And I would also point out that of all the people that are living in autism land, I have the greatest empathy right now um, for male fathers who are currently single parenting their children without any family support. They're neurodiverse themselves quite often. They either make a little bit too much money to qualify for services or they don't make, they can't keep their jobs. Like autistic women quite often have at least part of their lives where they have a secondary provider sometimes that can help offset that but it doesn't happen for males on the spectrum. And so I think supporting single parenting with more services, more supports, making systems navigable instead of there being all this hidden curriculum around social security and, and all those other systems, like that's how you can make life better for autistic people. Well, one thing my dad always taught me was to ask, and we would do the journalism model, you know, the five W's, why, how, what, when, where. And I think if you give a, a child, especially a female child, the license to say, I'm going to be inquisitive, I'm going to be scientific, I'm going to follow the research model and thinking, I'm going to problem solve, I'm not going to just be excused to go to the library, I'm going to dig in and I'm going to find out why. Once we have the whys behind the whatever it is that's coming to us, um, we can start to use our rational thinking, our logic, our pragmatics, our um, powers of observation, we can combine these things and then we can start to figure out w what the hidden curriculum is, what we need to do to get the job, what we need to do to maybe make a friend if we want one, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you know, self-knowledge and using your, your powers of intellect are two things that I would really emphasize and did emphasize with all my girls. Can I just, sorry, I'll just jump in again. Um, with Dina again um, saying about um, getting services. Um, it is, is so very true. In Australia, we have National Disability Insurance Scheme. It's separate from the uh, typical welfare that we have out there, but it's for extra support for people with disabilities. To get onto this scheme, you, the actual agency tells people, go in there and tell them about your worst day. Go in there and tell them how broken, how defective and everything you are. Same thing, what we're doing right here is I'm also a research assistant and a current project I'm working on is um, facilitating the voice of young adults on the autism spectrum to self-advocate and self-determine. So how do we turn it around going, right, we have society that's already going, we won't give you funding and support until you tell us that you're absolutely defective, but we're telling these people, the young adults that are coming up, going, but we want you to speak out and say, yes, we want all these different things. So it's such a major conflict. And we're actually, ha with our meetings and stuff like this, it's like we're trying to find a way to bring this all together from all different facets. So, yeah, it's, it's a very complex how we're going to change this all around. A real life experience. I make approximately $900 a month on Social Security disability. Um, I took a job at Towson University that pays me $3,000 a semester, and I just bumped myself out of Social Security insurance. $3,000 a semester. That's not even a full, like, annual salary. And now they took $400 of my $700 to pay my health care premium for Medicare. Like, how do people ever get ahead if there's no window of time where they can earn a little bit of money to get towards those goals? 
And, you know, so my friend looked at me and said, well, you need to stop teaching. Like, you're, it's costing you $800 a month because you're losing the 400 from your benefits, and you're also paying this insurance. And functionally, that's twice as much as it looks like, you know. This is not the way we're going to make progress in this population. Um, I live in New York. My son could live on $700 a month in Huntington, West Virginia. You know, I need every penny of that money plus student loans to function in New York. So we really, this is really a class issue, right? It's not just disability. It's about othering people and not giving them a springboard to step forward. Any final words about how we can empower women on the autism spectrum, including women with high support needs? And that will be my final question, and then we'll let the audience have a chance to talk with you as well. I would, I would just offer this. Um, when I was trying to understand and see whether or not the, oh, the autistic the autism profile, and I have to, this is a reader, I cannot take credit for this. Um, this is a reader who gave me this line, I think it's wonderful, if we start calling ASD instead of um, a disorder, the D, autism spectrum disorder, the autism spectrum dynamic, which I just think is awesome, so I've promised him that I'm gonna just keep, Jack, go Jack, um, I, that I'm gonna just keep putting that out there, whoops, and I think it's wonderful. Um, and I, when I was looking to see if that ASD profile at me and I had to literally go through and analyze and step back and look at every single tick off you know symptom or presentation of um, autism in, in boys and men generally but it, you know in people but largely it was is that press um, that sort of phenotype and um, I had to take a step back in each one and kind of say, okay, what's happening? What needs are they serving here, right? Um, the idea being like, no, I did not organize train tables or whatever, you know, like organize of, of, of train arrivals and bus schedules, but I did start drawing family trees of the English monarchy when I was like eight or nine, and it's the same moment, right, the same feeling of the relief of organizing information in ways that made sense. I didn't line up my cars, but I did put all my Barbies out together in ways that made tableaus and take pictures of them and make Barbie wedding albums. That's not interactive play. It's still lining up and making a display, but it looked a little different. So what I did was I put together, basically went through all of it. I made something that I call the checklist checklist, um, and we'll give you a link to, it's, um, it's in heels, but we'll give you a link that you can download it for free um, from my website because this is something I know Tony Atwood's using now as well. It's, um, it is uh, sort of just a really good bullet pointed list at all the different ways that um, the same needs can maybe be seen and identified and, and, and present themselves in girls because I think that all that we are talking about, all that we are talking about presupposes that we're seeing the girls and women. We can't do anything else if we're overlooking them still, except for, well, making us feel that we don't even belong amongst the group who often doesn't feel that they belong. Anyone else? Final comments? Um, empowering women, I'd say, is to find your tribe. Um, find the people that support you and get you and validate you. These people will help you along your way. They'll be the ones that go, yay, go you. We get where you're going. We'll go through the struggles with you. We feel the pain that you've been through. I found, when I found my tribe, that was the best thing I could have ever had. It was far better than my family ever was. It's far better than any friends that I tried to make in my previous life. These people who get me have helped me enormously and have made me the best person who I am today. So I thank let you all for that be, as well. Let you be the best person. They didn't make you. You already were wonderful. <laughs> Dina or Leanne? I think it's great that you can come from different perspectives. Like, I don't want to be dynamic. I want to be disabled. I'm okay with that. I think we need to destigmatize that language and take it back. So, you know, you have two women here, both autistic, both have very different points of view on things. Um, I see the functionality of using the clinical language. I see um, a need to destigmatize 
by owning it, very much like we have through the civil rights movement, through veterans advocacy, through women's rights. So, you know, um, but we as a community, that's one of the great things about us. We don't have black and white rules. Like, you know, it's like, oh, you want to take that point of view? Great, you rock. We also do polite things for each other that other people don't know about. Like, um, I'll get an email from one of the co-authors in the book, and she'll say, I'm having a bad day. Do you have the spoons to hear me out? And, I'll go, and, she, and I said, well, sure, uh, but can we do this in an hour? I need to finish something. Like, neurotypical people just, like, verbally vomit in your inbox, and you're like, ah, 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 you know. We respect that limited energy that we all go through every day with because we live with autism. So it's really fun how we can all just kind of work together to open each other's minds, and then we're still allowed to hold our point of view, you know, so. Hey, how many of you guys pictured a bunch of spoons in a drawer when she said that? <laughs> You're on the spectrum. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Barb, Jennifer, Leanne, and Dina, for answering our questions and telling us about um, your experiences. And now we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. We have a stand-up mic there if you'd like to ask your question, so please come to the mic. All right. Hi, I'm Audra. Um, I'm autistic, and I have epilepsy as well. Uh, throughout my career, I've faced a lot of discrimination in the workplace, and I have found that working for myself now is best is the best move that I've made. Um, and I find that with a lot of my autistic friends, several of them work for themselves. What tips can you give for employers to be more accommodating, more accepting? especially with those who have the other co-occurring conditions that can come along with autism. First of all, I, I want to go back to self-employment. Um, for those of you who don't know, individuals who have disabilities can go to vocational rehabilitation, present a solid business plan, and get funded to start up their own business. And it's a tool that very, very few people know about. There are some pretty hard and fast rules. It has to be viable. You have to be able to make enough money to get off of Social Security. Uh, that has to be the goal. Um, but I mean, at one point, I had a private practice in Nashville, and they gave me $25,000, basically. And, and then they don't give you a credit card. You have to write up you know, your expenses, where you would get it. How, it's very time-consuming, very executive function dynamic demanding, um, and they really had a problem with me. This is one of the difficulties with the system. They said, well, the last business plan we got was from someone who wanted to open a hot dog stand. I'm like, but I'm, I've got a master's degree, and my job, my objective looks very different from someone, and the VR system is, is it's like turning the Titanic right now to help them get on board with people who have DD but not ID. They really struggle to conceptualize that. Um, going back to your answer, and again, this is me, a very externalizing autistic, but I wrote my letter to get into my university, and I asked my friend Stephen, our friend Stephen, sure, should I disclose? And he said, let me ask you a different question. Do you want to be somewhere where that's a problem? And I was like, yeah, I don't want to be somewhere where right off the bat they struggle with the idea that I'm autistic. And so, I mean, I do live face forward. You know, I speak it, I say it, I don't have a problem with that. But, but for many people, they want to withhold the diagnosis until after they've got the job. So each person has to choose when and how they disclose. But for me, I don't want to be there if it's a problem at the time of the interview. I want to be able to be out about it from day one. And then I also find if you wait until after you're hired and things start to fall apart, now they don't believe you. It looks suspicious. And you don't have any legal rights under the ADA if you haven't disclosed and put your accommodation needs in writing. So I don't, I don't know. My recommendation, me personally, is not to wait, to be upfront about it, to make sure that you have an employer that understands and can accommodate you before you walk through the door. But that's not a position held by a lot of people. That's just me. Plus, equally, you should uh, 
point out that um, if you're getting services through voc rehab, you'll qualify for protected employment as an autism at work um, intern. Yeah. And there are probably 50 companies right now, big employers in America, that have embraced the autism at work initiative. So that's a place where we would be uh, welcomed. I need more. And sell yourself. I mean, give your, your, your public relations agent on your own. These are my disabilities. These are my challenges. But this is what I can do. And this is what I will do. And I can even volunteer and help human relations. And Right? Oh. Well, and the other, yeah. oh, and the other thing I've, I find is there. I say, um, if there. you give me these accommodations, I can be more productive for yeah, you. Exactly. They always want to know what's in it for them, right? Yeah. And this isn't just autism advice, yeah. by the way. This is like basic employment advice. But you're right. If the company is not on board, just you have to walk away, you know? And it. What Dina just said, I mean, that, that's the point, right? What goes for us, which is perhaps more essential for us, goes for everybody. There's not one dang thing that we're saying up here that's not good for people on the autism spectrum that isn't also beneficial to everybody on the human spectrum. So absolutely, you go in there and try to use and, not but. You know, I'm autistic, I'm autistic, but I can. But eliminates everything else you just, like, it's gone now, right? It's, I'm autistic. We all know that how the diagnostic tools, right? We all know that when you're filling those out, it's that, how often is this a problem? Is this a problem? Is this a problem? It's not, hey, is your kid really great at this, that, the other thing? It's, not, it's, it's you know, negative. So if it's, I happen to be on the autism spectrum, which means I'm really fabulous at blah, 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 blah. Especially if I can do some of my work from home based or distance, then here's how that, it's completely about selling that and not being apologetic. Um, and also giving yourself a, seeing eye friends, letting a couple people, one or two people who you really trust, um, the, the freedom or the license to perhaps read an email before you send it or read an email that you've received so that um, when the emotional charge is too high or you're not sure if it's coming through right or how you might be, how your response might be sounding, use that, I do, big time. And um, I also like to say it, evil twin, so that if you have this situation where an employer does know Right, you know, I, I with my friends, I'll s tell them this. I will at some point. I will say something that either offends you, ostracizes you, hurts your feelings. I will, and I can promise you one hundred thousand percent, it will never be intentional, ever. So, will you please do me a favor? If I say something and. If I start to see your reaction look a little bit off, I'm going to say evil twin. That's the clue to say stop. Okay, wait a second. Hold on. Maybe we have a bad Wi-Fi connection. Let's put the motions aside. Let's try again and listen to one another. Um, that comes with, tr there has to be trust, but there are ways around that. Um, yeah, so a couple little tips and tricks. Hi there. Uh, my name is Stephen, and, and first of all, all of you were just incredible, so thank you. I happen to be on the spectrum with mild Asperger's, and I stutter, and I do motivational speaking all over the, the country, and I've started to incorporate mentioning that I'm in Aspie, that's the term of endearment in my bio, but what I've discovered is there are, there's people who know what the spectrum is, but they don't really understand it, and you know, I tr I try to to draw examples using enter entertainment. Like if you've ever watched uh, the the Big Bang Theory, or if you've watched a uh, House, the way the doctor is like rude or like standoffish, and you know, while there are some 
people who nod and they're like, yeah, I get it. Now, you know, I really wonder if they really do understand it. So, I mean, do you, when you do your presentations, do you ever cite any positive ex examples if you if you know any? So. Mm -hmm. Um, sure, and it's interesting. First of all, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I have to say something. I just have to, my daughter, one of my daughter's best, best, best friends, um, also stutters. And I always tell, no, I always, he's fabulous. He's fabulous. And I always tell him and that, do not worry, because guess what? Whatever you're saying, it's worth waiting for. So, everybody in the room, take your time, it's all good. Um, so, that being said, um, Interesting that both of the characters you pointed out were male, right? Um, and that's so. But if you like those kinds of shows, uh, Bones um, is a, is one that I love, um, and also um, Rizzoli and Isles, um, which I have just come upon. But Angie Harmon is in it. It's a detective kind of, and the fact that um, the the gal who plays the um, uh, autopsy, help me, does autopsies. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the um, medical director at the, yeah, and the police department. I'm, I'm blanking, but regardless, her first name is Mora. That's my daughter's first name, so I was attracted instantly. Oh my gosh, she is an Aspie, she is an autism and heels kind of chick. And she struggles and is warm. And I think the more, more yes, the more kinds that you can show, sure. Um, but I don't think, you know, as much as there is, there is an element of, I can know what it's like to struggle to be understood because I don't stutter, Stephen, but for all my ch 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 I am misunderstood more often than not. I can extend compassion. I can identify as best I can, but I will never walk your walk. But that's why it's so important that you just keep talking your talk. Because we'll all wait and listen. There's um, also quite a few uh, uh, diagnos diagnoses given posthumously. Shakespeare, Tom Jefferson, um, who, who, oh, Jane, Jane, Jane Austen. Um, oh, now I'm blanking. You've caused Green a problem here now. <laughs> Daryl Hannah. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Daryl Hannah, Steven Spielberg. I think Martha Stewart. Don't tell her. Um, David Letterman. We could go on and on. But I think, the, you know, when you see that literal thinking and, Jerry Seinfeld, remember he came out and said, I think I have autism or Asperger's syndrome, and everybody said, oh, you can't, you can't. And I thought, why wouldn't we want, A, his money, and B, his support? How do we know he's not on the spectrum? So this misunderstanding is very true, and, and I think when we all spread the unique idiosyncrasies that we have that we maybe have learned to cover up or change through our vernacular or whatever, we're all quite different, but we all have the same issues. So rock on, everybody that's different. Here's my short list. Um, uh, if you like darker kind of adult things, the bridge that was on for quite a while was really, really good. Um, it's controversial because it's a male savant white guy, but the good doctor, I have to put a plug in for it because I have never seen an actor depict the experience of being autistic quite as well as I've seen him do it for a non, non autistic person. If you don't know this, all the graphics he visualizes are designed by autistic graphic designers in a lab. So I think that is really amazing. They've hired multiple autistic actors to be in supporting roles. So I think although, you know, in, in an ideal world, you'd like an autistic or disabled actor playing an autistic or disabled actor, I think this is pretty close to a compromise. I think it's really well. In my presentations, I believe we've been looking at autistic people in great literature for years and years and years, and they just didn't have a word. Um, and my favorite is Pinocchio. If you go back and you watch Pinocchio with a big glass of Chardonnay and a big box of p tissues, like it'll all start to fall in place. He calls people objects. He says, what are they? He uh, doesn't know he's in trouble until he grows a tail, and yet he's got a very ableistic, I know, heroic outcome, right? Um, but it's really kind of good. Robin Williams and Flubber, 
and also the Fred McMurray version yeah. are very nice things. But I have to say, someone brought this to my attention last week, and I loved it. Um, I always joke around about the reason I see autistic characters in movies is because it's like uh, The Sixth Sense. He saw dead people. And she goes, oh, no. She goes, that was what getting an autism diagnosis was like for me. And I'm like, what? And she's like, I was going along and doing all my things, and then all of a sudden I got my diagnosis. Just like he's, you know, the, the, the character said, oh, I'm dead. And you go back through the whole movie, right? That's the way this uh, producer creates. Shyamalan does things. And all of a sudden, it all made sense. And I'm like, damn, that's really good. That's really awesome, you know? Because it does describe what it's like where you go back and retrospectively, like, revisit everything and it explains things. So, sorry. Hi. Um Jennifer, you had talked about how we need to sell ourselves, but I noticed, I didn't realize it till after it happened. I was up for a job that I was very excited about that I think I would have been a perfect fit for. My first interview was with women, and I did a perfect job of selling myself. My second interview was with a man, and I was raised in a very patriarchal society. I am the youngest of seven children. All of my older siblings are men. You know, so I was raised to not do better than the boys. And so in that interview, I was talking myself down. Like he would say, you know, the other ladies told me this and this about you. And then I was like, I was sort of like minimizing it. And, and, and I didn't even realize I did it till after the fact when I realized, you know, that they'd said they were going the other way with, with a different candidate. And because the, the first interview, they sounded like I was their pick and everything. And I was just so upset about that because it's not just the stuff I have to learn about the spectrum because I didn't get my diagnosis until 47 but just being raised in in this culture of being you know a female in a very patriarchal society and I was, I was just wondering if you've ever if anyone else in all of your bathroom conversations have ever said that kind of thing because I think it might be like a type of masking as well that we have to put on a special face when we talk to men versus when we talk to our peers I, I don't think that that's really even an autism thing. Um, I think it is, I think it's true in general. Um, this is just my opinion. But I, I, I know uh, for sure there I, I have, there is, um, there is a different way that I've learned that I need to approach women right away. I, I only give genuine compliments, for instance. I've also learned that I will give a compliment to a woman right up front, pretty quickly. Um, and it's a way of diffusing because sometimes women, you know, Madeline Albright, I think, said there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. Um, and I have found that the worst cut downs I've had have been at the hands of other women, which breaks my heart. So I do that immediately, say I'm not a threat. Um, but I mean it. But it's sad that I have to do it. With men, it's a different thing, too, because you're in a constant balance to, um, to prove yourself, um, to prove yourself to yourself, to the world in general, um, and to... Yeah, there are so very many little lines and dances. That's the reality. So I think it's that's the kind of situation where, okay, it felt icky and bleh, right? Well, I can tell you I had a... No, but I mean, after the, after the fact, it's a, it's a bummer that it... Yes. And that's exactly... Because I was going to say, I can tell you the worst. I'm usually pretty dang good on job interviews, but the one that I ever did, it was while I was in college, like, looking for my first real job out of, you know, and boy, did I take this too literally. I was being asked... I was uh, an, uh, an advertising agency, the worst job for anybody on the spectrum. But anyway, um, was being asked, like, what was... Tell me about sort of the, a really bad experience you've had and, and how you've come through it. Well, I had just gotten out of a... Uh, physically violent relationship for a year and a half. And I was very proud that I had extricated myself, that I had pressed charges, done X, Y, and I started telling, talking about this in the middle of the job interview. Perhaps not the most inappropriate, but it was my honest answer. But I didn't get why that didn't work. So, okay, I could take that, extrapolate, talk through it with other people, and practice more. So for me, that's what I would say to you is, practice more. Try to not say I'm sorry. Um, and... Practice, look for some words that are, that are going to be consistently positive, that aren't opinions, that are simply factual. 
because nobody can shoot that down. Worth looking at in therapy, lady. Yeah, good well, stuff to unpack. Good stuff to unpack. I think what we're talking about here is autism is a feminist issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we are women who are in a patriarchally oriented society, and we just happen to have autism layered underneath that. You know, where we're we're not only trying to juggle, you know, the society that is more male friendly more male sensitized, but we're also dealing with family history, family trauma, societal trauma. Um, I did a presentation on autism and trauma for my university, and at the break a woman came up and she said, well, as a true trauma researcher, subordinating me, she said, I would call those difficult moments. And I'm like, well, then you really don't understand autism because what is a difficult moment to you as a subjective observer is a trauma for me. And until you realize that, that and you stop subordinating it, you'll never really be an effective provider with this community. Yeah. I was very direct with her because I just didn't have any patience for that. But that's what happens. You know, we say all oh, the lights bother me. And for the guy, they unscrew the light bulb over his head because he had cataract surgery, but I don't get the same benefit. Like, what's that about? You know, well, he's a guy and he donates more money. That's what that was about. Um, and so I embarrassed the people a couple of times, and suddenly the lighting got fixed, you know. But it's ridiculous. But, yeah, autism is definitely a feminist issue. So. How did you know? <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Barb, Jennifer, Leanne, and Dina, for being here with us and sharing it with, you, with us from your personal journeys. We really appreciate hearing from you. And after this presentation, if anyone has a book that they'd like signed, uh, all of these wonderful ladies will be happy to help sign those books for you. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.